Today on the Rebelcast, obelisks, are they used for good or evil, and why did the ancient Egyptians build them, and how are they connected to spirituality and materialism? We will go in details about their nature and use over the years, where you will discover a lot of relations between them and modern day symbolism. Stay tuned for more, my name is Hassan, and you are listening to episode 14 of The Rebel. Before we start, don't forget to like, share, subscribe, and activate notifications, as it does help me create more content for you. Let's dive into the rabbit hole. Thank you everybody for joining into The Rebelcast, a place where we approach to solve the riddle called life. Today, I need you to have your mind pretty wide open to what will be revealed, as it is a heavy topic that will connect many points we have raised in previous episodes so far. We will be talking about the nature of the obelisks. Are they used for good or evil? Or maybe both? First of all, an obelisk is a stone pillar, typically having a square or rectangular cross section and a pyramidal top, usually made of gold. It was set up in ancient Egypt as a monument or landmark, Arabs refer to it as a masalla, which means needle, and that's actually where we get the name of Cleopatra's needle. The Greeks refer to it as an obeliskos, which means meat skewer. But the real ancient Egyptian word for it is techenu, which means to pierce. Ancient Egyptians usually erected them in pairs at the sides of doors, unlike in modern days where they are placed in courts. Also, there is only 21 Egyptian obelisks left in the world, with only 5 still in Egypt. The rest were taken to different parts of the earth. Let me now gather for you some major key ideas about this monument that are needed to understand the whole picture. First, these monolithic, four-sided pyramid top pillars rose high into the Egyptian sky. They symbolized the earthly element manifestation of a sun ray being pointed up to the sky. Also was believed as a powerful monument that can bring the dead back to life. That's why it was placed in funerals of pharaohs, as to assist their spirit in their reincarnation process through the power of the sun. Moreover, it symbolizes the sun god Ra, as well as of the power of the pharaoh and his relationship to the gods. Also, most of those obelisks originated from a city called Heliopolis in ancient Egypt, which means the city of the sun. This also gives us a powerful relation between the obelisks and the sun. The major surviving remnant of Heliopolis is the obelisk of the temple of Ra Atom, whom both were solar deities. But Atom was the higher one, more specifically related to the sunset sun, unlike Ra, whom is linked to the morning and midday sun. And by the way, the modern day word of an atom is related to this ancient god as he was believed to be the creator of the universe whom he created himself and then the universe through masturbation. Yes, it sounds silly, but it's a major key element to remember. Also, an important fact you need to know that ancient Egypt had many names across history like Tameri, which means the beloved land, Taseti, the land of the bow, which was used for the southernmost regions of the country, and Nubia, which means gold. Another name was Kemet, which means the black land. It's so clear how much importance ancient Egyptians gave to the lands as they literally induced the word land in naming their civilization. Let me know in the comment box if you want me to do an episode where I go in details about the names of ancient Egypt and their gods. The obelisks, on the other hand, have deep relation to the land itself, as the matter which they are made up from is granite, originating deep down from earth and shows above the surface through earthquakes. So what they actually do, they mold this precious piece of matter into this form also in appreciation to the land itself. And don't forget that ancient Egyptians were the first to systemize the study of alchemy, as the word alchemy comes from the word Kem, which is the name of ancient Egypt. So basically the golden pyramid on the top represents the higher self, and the granite structure below it represents the lower self. So the obelisk can also be an alchemical symbol representing the journey of the soul from the lower self to the higher one. But when I discovered that it's also called the land of the bow, it ringed a lot of things in my head. So I started questioning the relation between that name and the obelisks. 
What I discovered that archery played a huge role in keeping their land safe linked to the obelisks as it's basically a piercing arrow that points up to heavens. So building a huge structure of an arrow to point to the sky means two main things. First, they bring fear to the hearts of the enemies not to mess with such civilization. So the obelisk had a more of a military symbol of power. Same as in our modern days, there's many military symbols used. In addition to modern day obelisks, like the one in Washington DC for example, where by no coincidence the World War II memorial is aligned with it. In addition to the Chickamauga and Chattanooga National Military Park, where an obelisk is placed there too. So the obelisk was like a marker of power and victory till our modern days. But to build a huge one is like building a huge arrow pointing to the sky to wage a war against the mighty god with a musculine shaped monolithic structure. It also reminds me of the image of Zeus holding a bolt of lightning as the obelisk can be considered in this case a ray of light being pointed back to the mighty god. Which is also reflected in the ancient pharaoh days where they received monotheistic prophets that preached them the oneness of one god yet they refused and insisted that they are the gods on earth. And their end, as we all know, was catastrophic, as all civilizations of history were destroyed because their kings and leaders worked their way out of ego to call themselves gods above all and wage a war against the Almighty. The same way Merdok of Babylon, whom is also called Nimrud, considered himself as the highest of gods, and in his story he waged a war against the Almighty, where he literally pointed an arrow and targeted God in the sky to shoot him. And his end was also catastrophic. I'll give you a small hint here about this detail. In our modern days, the rockets we launch the sky, for example, are a symbol of a modern day mobile phallic obelisk being shooted to the sky and it's not a coincidence that the father of space travel Jack Parsons was a devil worshipper whom he himself invoked an entity by the name of Babylon reminding us of the Babylonian Merdok and he believed he got embodied by the Antichrist himself as we discussed his story in details in episode 4 whom I recommend you to watch to better understand the riddle. Now let's dive into the architectural symbolism of the obelisks and their relation to the spiritual and the physical world. But first, do me a huge favor by liking and sharing this podcast anywhere you can because it does help me create more content for you. You need to know that those monuments have more symbolic meaning than physical. Also, they are not easy to build and need a lot of hard work. Let me know in the comments if you want me to do a video of how the obelisks are being built. The design itself has a huge impact on humans without even considering the material. First, you need to know the difference of the functioning between a column pillar and an obelisk. In its design, a column pillar decodes a lot of information by just looking at it. It's a support for an upper element. This tells us that a column has an earthly symbol, the support of a civilization. Also, they had the shape of plants, as if the top is blooming out of the plant pillar. Usually, the ancient Egyptians wrote on them historical, architectural, educational facts about their civilization. And you need to know that columns have more feminine nature, as they are curved, unlike the obelisks, which have masculine nature, being of linear four faces. The obelisk, on the contrary, is not built to support a top. They are a symbol not just for Earth, but also the sky. So they have a dual nature, being the materialized earthly rays of light, and being open and pointing to the sky, giving it the unseen air element connected to their god Amun, the god of the unseen. And once the rays of the sun hit the obelisk, it represents the union between Amun and Ra, which was perceived as one god called Amun-Ra. Also it tells anyone that looks at it that it can stand by itself without a roof. Not just that, but also obelisks brought the ability for Egyptians to write linearly 
on four different sides and bring this information to a certain place and time, not limiting the information to be based upon a column pillar or a wall. So they were able to spread the information out in the open space. This also gives us an idea that the obelisks were used as a propaganda pillar for the pharaohs to induce their ideology upon their people. Also, an obelisk had more of the spiritual writings on it. As you will see, Amun, the god of the unseen, carved on them, assisting other gods in their journey of reincarnation. As we mentioned before, obelisks have their reincarnation symbolism being placed in funerals. They also were built as a glorification symbol, reflecting the greatness of the civilization and its god, as I found written on the headship Sut's obelisk, whom she was the fifth pharaoh of the 18th dynasty. She wrote that she erected two of the obelisks for her father Amun, and that they could be seen from the other side of the Nile, their tips gleaming electrum, and electrum was a mixture of gold and silver. This gives us an idea that those obelisks not just had spiritual meaning, but also were used for navigation to mark a certain territory. So the glow of the tip of the obelisk enabled Egyptians to navigate on earth, which forms a beautiful natural connection between the above and the below. They advanced their technologies following the laws of nature and doing their best to use the elements being given to them as wise and efficient as possible. In addition to the gold being used at the top of the obelisk, the lower structure of the obelisk was made of red granite, and this symbolized the alchemy from the lower state, which is granite, to the higher state, which is gold, as transforming the lower state into higher. In addition, we need to know that granite is an igneous rock, which means that it was formed from molten lava deep within the Earth's crust. As the lava cools, it crystallizes under enormous pressure and is brought up to Earth through earthquakes that even can form granite mountains. It has crystals inside it that Earth in its own way produces. So it has stored energy from the lava and from the underground over the years. Ancient Egyptians, of course, knew all of that back then. So they chose it to be the matter of the obelisk as crystals inside it can absorb energy from the sun itself and that energy will be conducted to earth or in other words to the black lands of Kemet which will bring them more power to their lands for spiritual and agricultural reasons. Also the faces of the obelisks are full of spiritual writings connecting the above with the below, the spiritual with the materialistic and can symbolize reincarnation and death, as they believed that the sun rays, once they hit a certain face, the face becomes immersed with the great solar power of their god Ra and enlightens their writing, which will assist their pharaohs on their path to the heavens as clearly it's pointing upwards. Yet, it's all in terms of information, as what gets reincarnated back is information that the spirit used to produce. Also, other faces of the obelisks might be in the shadow, this symbolizes death, then the light portion of the obelisk symbolizes getting born, as life keeps moving in that cycle eternally. Not to forget also to mention that the obelisks also were used as the sundial, which is a device to measure the time through the shadow being casted from the obelisk. Now let's dive into the geometrical meaning induced inside this monument. The obelisk has a linear shape, which as we discussed before in episode 12, is of masculine nature, unlike the curved is of feminine. I would really recommend you to watch episode 12 of the Rebelcast, as it will let you understand better about the sacred geometry. I'll leave the link in the description box. So, unlike the column pillar, the obelisk has the masculine active energy inside it, which brings a feeling of authority and power for those who perceive this ancient civilization. Yet, we need not to forget that ancient Egypt was also balanced with the feminine aspect of the column pillars. It's a symbol of human power, knowledge, and achievements. Yet, if this knowledge is out of order, it can destroy everything. And that is why knowledge is power and needs to be used wisely and not to fall in the hands of the evil ones. Yet, 
all of us has good and evil sides. The true wise are the ones that balance between them. And those are the ones that are held worthy of such power. In addition to all that, I also read a myth about the Egyptian god Osiris, where his brother Set chopped him into 14 parts. Then Osiris' wife, Isis, was able to gather all of the parts except for one, which was his penis. And after she succeeded in bringing the 13 parts together, she placed an artificial penis on his coffin. And since that time, some scholars considered those obelisks to be as a phallic symbol for their god Osiris. I would really like to know your opinion about this story, so if you have any interesting idea about it, make sure to leave it in the comment box. All that been said, clear as light. It shows how the obelisks had many functionalities back in ancient Egyptian days, from spiritual to physical. But I'm sure you're asking why would such monuments be placed in St. Peter's Square or Washington DC, New York, Paris or even Mecca? Is it used to invoke entities, or maybe for sexual symbolism? Or are they still the Amun-Ra worshippers? All those questions will be answered in the next episode of The Rebelcast. And the symphony of God continues in an approach to solve this riddle called life. Stay tuned for more. My name is Hassan. And you were listening to the Rebel Cast. We, we are, are the Rebel, Rebel Angels. Angels. They glitch in your matrix. Before I go, I want to give you a special thanks for reaching this part of the podcast. Also, if you want to get my albums for free, including personalized compost tracks, exclusive content, and much more, you can do that by supporting my content on Patreon. I'll leave you the link in the description box. Thank you so much.